So today we're at Kimberley Farms in Somes. This is Kimberley van Disterlo. And I'm here today with Anna Biel, the board member of the Cato PNNA. So thank you, Kim, for having us today. Well, you're very welcome. I'm very excited. Um, so how did you get into uh, the hunter jumper business and especially the Dutch horses? Um, well, I, I rode as a junior and I rode hunters and jumpers. And uh, in my mid twenties, I got this wild idea that I was gonna buy a mare and breeder. And uh, at that time I reached out to Tish Quirk um, and was able to use her valuable insight and guidance and bred that mare to her infamous stallion, best of luck, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, and who's also, he produced several stallion sons. Um, but my, so my first foals were, uh, the first four were best of luck offspring. One of which was a mare that I kept, um, and she was the foundation of my breeding program. I also um, have acquired uh, Dutch mares, uh, either uh, you know within the United States or in Holland, um, and have continued to you know uh, expand my knowledge of of the Dutch bloodlines, etc. And so that's where we are today. And I think we'll talk about uh, where we're going. Um, we've done very well in curings and in sport with, with the uh, prior product of what we, you know, what we developed um, in, the, in the last 30 years. Uh, I will say I've been a member since 1985. Um, and so one of the, not the founding members, but very close to it. Um, it's the only registry I've ever used. I feel the KWPN gives superior customer service, um, definitely has a higher caliber of, uh, horse. Um, I believe that the KWPN curing process, um, utilizes a much higher standard in evaluating the, the horses for approval and for star accreditation, et cetera. Um, and that is also what I am trying to mirror in my breeding program. Uh, to breed horses for the top of sport um, and in that regard I'll, I'll announce that uh, I recently found out I am a gold level breeder for the KWPN uh, which is very exciting. Congratulations! And now, <laughs> and now I'll be working towards the platinum status. Yay! <laughs> Looking forward to curing starting back up again uh, once the COVID restrictions are lifted. I have some uh, a few promising mares that I'd like to present, um, and you know we can talk about how I've changed my model from um, a prior broader market to a more narrow uh, professional market. The model has morphed over the years to now being primarily focused on breeding jumper uh, performance horses for the top of sport, and in that endeavor, I have been very lucky to find two young professionals um, in the business who have um, a very ambitious and aggressive approach to being successful. And I would like to introduce um, Ben Stout and Emma Irwin, who are my partners in crime at Kimberly Farms now. And uh, they've been instrumental in refocusing uh, Kimberly Farms business model and very excited about the future. And I you know, think that they can talk about what our plans are for the future a little bit more. Yeah, and how you met. I'm curious yeah, how that so, went. How did it go? Uh, Kim and I met over Facebook, actually, when I was still working in Holland. Um, I saw some of the horses that she was breeding, and I, I didn't know people were breeding, you know, uh, those bloodlines here. Um, so I reached out, we started talking, and it turns out, you know, kind of when I was looking to come back to America, she was looking to make quite a few changes around here. So, yeah, and it's Emma joined us about a year ago now. Um, she worked in Europe for what four years um, so we've kind of morphed Kim's business from you know breeding a lot um, to scale down the breeding uh, we've worked to increase the quality of the breeding and then uh, bring in sale horses as well um, so now it's a, a mix of both sales horses breeding and then producing Kim's Kim's ones that we decide to hang on to So Kimberly, who are we watching here? 
We are now watching the mare Mistral KF. She's by Etalone out of a Cambridge mare. Uh, her dam produced two approved stallion sons that competed in Germany, uh, as well as a three star of any horse. And you bred her in the Netherlands. Yeah, she was bred in the Netherlands. Um, I found the mare through Yanko at VDL Stud, uh, her dam, and she was already in foal to Corlin. I sold that Corlin colt in Holland, um, and then we bred her to Etalone, and which is a stallion that I have always wanted offspring from. And fortunately, she was a filly, so she's a keeper. Nice. Uh, this one will keep for breeding. She actually did have an embryo transfer this year um, by the stallion Copycat Z. We chose to do ET with her because we are planning to compete her in the five-year-old jumper classes, young jumper classes. In fact, she will be going to Thermo tomorrow and will debut in a five-year-old classes next week. So what type of a training program do you use with her development? Um, how many days on the flat do you work her? How many days a week do you jump her? What's your normal program with the young yeah, horse? So she was started later than uh, the other three-year-olds, I guess now, not two years ago. Um, most of the three-year-olds, we bring them inside at the beginning of the year. When they turn three, get them used to the walker, the turnout, grooming, all of that. Um, she was started about six months later than all the other ones, just because of her size. Um, and at the beginning, uh, as a three-year-old, we ride them at, at the beginning, you know, one day a week days a week every other day and it's not till the end of the three-year-old year that we start riding them more consistently Kimberly, who are we looking at now? Uh, we are now looking at Gnarly Girl Pig Out. She's a coming four-year-old mare by Harley out of a Chin Chin Portland mare. I bred this mare in Holland and imported her as about an 18-month-old. Um, she was started last year by Ben. She's got a nice trot on her too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's... A, uh, like I said, a little mare with a big step. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot, a lot of small horses in the sport now, because of course they're getting more technical. They're yeah, be more rideable, more absolutely turnable and... more turns. The time's getting tighter. There's shorter lines and longer lines. I've always uh, strove to um, breed jumping horses that can move well. Um, as we know, the canter is the most important gate in a jumper. Um, also, probably likely in a dressage horse yes, as well. Um, I think we look at a lot of the same things in the canter. Maybe not quite as uphill, but definitely we, we look for the power behind in the canter. Well, it's not that we're necessarily looking for a small horse, it's, it's a type. Yeah. It's okay, a type. A type. Yeah. yeah. So that's athleticism in the horse. And the ability to adjust yeah. in the canter is really important and, for and a power. And the power. power. Yeah. So how is braveness uh, as mental aspect for jumping horses? Is that super important? Or as you say, like you can er earn the spooky horses trust and make them better or? Yeah, there needs to be such a fine balance. You get a horse that's too brave and you lose the carefulness. You okay. get a horse that's too spooky and you don't complete a lot of the courses. The scale we always talk about, there's carefulness and forgiveness, right? So forgiveness, that's what you want in an amateur horse. You know that no matter what they're going to go through the jump if you put them at a bad situation they'll go through rather than stop that's what you need in the amateur market but you you know it's very very rare to have a horse that can do both that's why it's a scale because if they're all the way careful they're not going to be forgiving right 
taking the young horses to the bigger shows with the older horses is our approach to what the Europeans do where they have a venue that could be right down the street and they trail ride their young horse down to get exposure. We don't have that, so we take the young horses to the big shows to get that experience. So when they do go to show, it's really a non-event for them. How many foals do you produce each year still? Um, well, we went from a, a high, or I went from a high of 10 to 11 foals a year down to um, two to three. I mean, we it depends three. on the year. Yeah. You know, uh, the prior, the, in, in the last year, I sold several mares in full. Um, they were getting older and it was, it was time to um, sort of uh, upgrade um, our breeding program. And um, we, are, we also look at uh, mares that are currently in sport or had a sport record that may be available for lease for an embryo transfer. Um, again, the emphasis is on breeding the next generation for the top of sport. Um, we always look though at temperament um, on our you know, stallion choices and our mare choices, um, just in case the, the offspring you know, may, may show plenty of talent they may be not talent for the top of sport we have the temperament for the very large amateur market in the United States so we run our business B sport horses out of Kimberly Farms um, Kim makes up probably now 80% of our of our business um, we spend quite a bit of time at the shows anywhere from 25% to you know right now we're gonna go for what, almost four weeks now thermal it, it is known that the majority of horse sales at the higher end happen at horse shows. Um, so it's important for our young stock to be at the shows, whether they're showing or not, um, because you have a captive audience uh -huh. for, for sales. Yeah, so when we go to a show, you know, maybe we have a, a three-year-old, you know, we don't show our three-year-olds, but you know, if we have the stalls, we'll bring them with us. Otherwise, they're sitting here. Um, so we'll bring them and, and then you have, you know, the entire, you know, we go to Thermal, we have the entire West Coast market at the same place to see all of our horses at once. So it helps a lot with sales. Um, and we find the the market really, really favors horses that are going and showing. Um, so if you have a five-year-old that needs to be showing in the five-year-old jumper classes, um, otherwise people just aren't interested if they're behind. Yep. So. Hey, and guys, something else. Uh, the theme of our AGM this coming year of this year in March will be passion and knowledge. So I would want to ask you guys, like, where do you get most of your knowledge from? Where did you get all your knowledge from? You, you mentioned Tish Crook before. And, oh yeah, in the very beginning, you know. sure. Um, just, you know, old school, uh, a lot of research, a lot of reading, um, reading the, the, the stallion programs when they came out. Um, you know, back in my day it was, asking for videotapes from VDL. But, uh, you know, now I, everything is, you know, right at your fingertips. Um, I do utilize um, uh, Ben and Emma for a lot of um, the research as far as sport records on, on potential stallion candidates or, and or mares. They, they have their finger on the pulse of, you know, the mares that are out there possibly available that are in a field somewhere not doing anything um, that had a great record and is, a, has been pensioned, but maybe could be brought back for breeding purposes. I think why our partnership works so well is, you know, the three of us all have different experience in different things. Uh, you know, Kim's done the breeding, Emma's jumped the top sport, I do the young horses. So we're able to kind of bring those three things together to make a business and a partnership that works really well. And learn from each other along the yeah. way. Well, thank you guys.